Thank you very much. It's uh, President Lagarde, it's Delane. Thank you so much for this um, opportunity to address you. Uh, I, I particularly wanted, I want to start by saying a word about the European Central Bank and the European Union, uh, because later on in this talk, I'm going to talk about the need for international organizations to deal with climate change. And in my own thinking, I've been very much affected by the growth and structure of the European Union and the European Central Bank as models that we can use for international governance, and in particular, the EU system as a kind of what I'll call later a compact, climate compact, was the very model that I had in mind. So let me now get started. I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you because I'll have some, um, uh, some of what I'll say will be more easily seen with pictures than with words alone. So let me share my screen. So what, uh, what I want to talk about today is climate change policy, and I'll talk a little bit about finance and um, green central banking, but uh, most of my discussion will cover issues of climate change. And what I'd like to do is um, bring you up to date on where the economics and some of the sciences um, are, but uh, um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'll just touch on those. Uh, before I get to the policy issues. Many of you are well aware of this. This is uh, something that's not as a stranger to the audience here. But I think I'd like to also put it in the context later on of monetary policy and some of the other crises we face. So uh, the major themes I want to talk about today is first, I want to emphasize that there has been very little progress in slowing emissions. I'll, uh, that may be um, in your, that may have occurred to you, you may know that, but I'd want to show you some of the quantitative uh, aspects of that. <clears throat> then I'll talk about the ch challenges for climate policy and some of the solutions that economists have come up with. And then I'll end with a little bit on green finance and banking. So the first thing uh, I want to show is just bring you up to date on the linkage on econ the economy and emissions. Um, this is CO2, global CO2 emissions as best we can measure back uh, to uh, 1900. And the uh, blue dot um, are the um, uh, actual and the red line is the trend. It's a logarithmic graph. So you, a trend is a straight line. And what I focused on is, um, well, it, it's a picture of the last uh, roughly 120 years, but what I also wanted to picture is what's happened in the last uh, 30 years. And I th the thing I would emphasize is that uh, there's been rel relatively little slowdown in the growth of emissions uh, globally, uh, that uh, there have been periods of, obviously, you can see the ups and downs, you see the the downs of the depression, you see the ups of the very rapid growth after World War II, you see the impact of the energy crisis with the higher energy prices leading to slightly slower uh, growth of emissions. One of the things you do not see in this, however, is any strong impact of climate policies. Uh, if you go back to the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, uh, which is uh, right about here, or the Paris Accord, which is uh, just uh, not very long ago, you really cannot see a strong impact of these climate policies on global emissions. <clears throat> of course, there's much going on here and behind this aggregate curve, but uh, there's also the basic point that emissions are continuing to grow. Now, this is something that a scientist would look at, but I think as economists, we would more naturally look at uh, carbon intensity. I should mention this is industrial carbon. It does not include land use changes, which are more difficult to measure actually than uh, actually very difficult to me measure and quite controversial, particularly before the last 30 years. But uh, industrial emissions are relatively well measured. But for economists, uh, what we'd want to look at uh, is the um, carbon intensity uh, which I haven't shown here, but the carbon intensity has actually not changed either. So the carbon intensity has been declining at about 2% a year. 
um, and uh, the um, that also has not changed very much. Uh, but what I, something I'd like to show you, which is uh, probably you haven't seen, is actually quite interesting, is the question about how CO2 concentrations have changed during the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, probably the only thing that's measured in this area with great precision from the very beginning to the very end is the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, that's something that's subject to very careful and uh, in, uh, low air measurement. Uh, that These measures of atmospheric concentrations in Hawaii go back to 1957. It was one of the great triumphs of uh, earth science to have thought of that and continued it. And what I have here is the concentrations through September of 2020. Uh, and the, green, the, red, the blue lines are the actual ones. Uh, they have seasonal fluctuations because of uptake of the biosphere. And the red line is seasonally adjusted. Uh, and, and what you can see here is uh, that even though emissions we know have declined, we don't know quite how much, since February of 2020, you, if you didn't know that we were in the middle of a pandemic, you would not see anything happening to concentrations. There's, it's basically uh, constant growth plus noise. Um, now, the reason I say this, it's, it's an interesting fact in itself, but the reason I say this is that it emphasizes the enormous inertia of the Earth system. Uh, not particularly of emissions, but of concentrations and other downstream events that follow on in the Earth system after emissions, that even though we have had a very sharp decline in emissions since February of this year, we cannot actually see it in the concentrations data as of yet. Um, and the other downstream effects, for example, temperature, which will be a function of concentrations, and other things, sea level rise, ice sheet melting, uh, agricultural losses, and the other issues that President Lagarde mentioned uh, necessarily also are ones that will be slow to respond. So the, one of the very, very first points here, which is, is critical for thinking about policy, is the very long time lags between human events that cause the emissions on the one hand and the ultimate geophysical consequences, and then economic consequences that follow those. Um, so this is a, this was, I have to say, this was a big surprise when I looked at this. I assumed there would be a decline, but uh, that, that's, that's science, it's full of surprises. Now, I wanna talk next about the role of economics in climate policy, and uh, there are basically three things I'm going to mention here. One having to do with what kinds of instruments to use, another one about um, science uh, and technology, and a third about international policy. So there are three insights that economics brings to this. Um, one having to do with technology, the second have to do with pricing, and a third to do with international coordination. So key economic insight one is the inadequate investment in low carbon technologies. Now this is widely known, it's widely intuitive if you like, it's that we are not investing as much as we can in some of the important low carbon technologies. Carbon capture and sequestration is still in the laboratories. If you think of things like um, low, uh, high temperature superconductivity, of which there have been some breakthroughs, um, which would be important for the electricity sector. Uh, different, different forms of um, low carbon energy, hydrogen economy, and so on. These require vast changes in technology, and we're investing relatively little. So the economics of this is pretty straightforward. And it is that innovation itself has big spillovers. And we know from the history of invention and innovation 
that the public returns on innovation are many times larger than the private returns. And, and you can all take your favorite example, but my favorite example is the copy machine, which was invented by Chester Carlson. And he, he did not die a poor man, but if you think of the kinds of the, the, the savings of all the scribes of the world since that was invented approximately 60 years ago, many, many, many times larger than the returns that he and other got from this fabulous invention. And even if you take other inventions, more modern ones, maybe more complex ones, maybe more important ones like the smartphone, uh, it is true that some of the inventors of the smartphones are wealthy people. But if you look at the value of the smartphones to the people who use them, uh, the, the 4 billion people with smartphones around the world, it's many, many times larger than the private returns. So that's the first feature. We know that. That's innovation, green innovation, brown innovation, neutral innovation, innovation in computers, innovation in biotech, whatever it is. The public returns are many times larger than the private returns. But here is where, uh, exp this is where uh, environmental issues, spillover issues, and particular climate change comes in, that there's a double externality here. There's not just the externality of the innovation, the spillover of the innovation, but so there's a climate impact externality as well. And so when you're thinking of a, uh, say a US company is thinking of inventing or develop in invention, research, development, commercialization, deployment of a zero carbon technology or a negative carbon technology, uh, then in the current environment, that firm will realize that the value to that, to the, to the public, is doubly larger than the value to the firm. It's doubly valuable because, to begin with, the firm will only get a small part of the return to that innovation. But in ad addition, the impact on climate change through reducing CO2 and other greenhouse gases will also be under rewarded because the price on CO2 is below its social cost. So the first thing, first critical economic insight about climate change is this double externality and how this will hobble investments in research development and commercialization of the low, zero, and negative carbon activities. This is important, obviously, but it's particularly important in the long run because of the need to turn over, replace our capital stock. If you look at the capital stock of most of our countries, about 75% of it in terms of the fuel use is fossil fuel. If we're going to get to a low carbon or a zero carbon future, which is what many goals, what our goals are in many cases, what many of our political figures have aimed for, what are the aspirations of the Green New Deal in this country and in Britain also, which was one of the innovators of the Green New Deal, it's a zero carbon society. But that means that the capital stock of our country will need to change. This means the fossil fuel industry. This means the um, electrical generating plants that run on natural gas or coal. This means the gasoline stations. This means the way we fly, deploy our aircraft. Many, many areas uh, will have to change. But to change, we're going to need new technologies in almost all these areas. If you take something like a hydrogen economy, you can imagine how much change would be needed. But this, in turn, will face this enormous hurdle of the double externality. So the first key economic insight is that policy requires fixing not just the climate externality, but also special incentives for low carbon technologies. I won't talk about those now. That's, a, that's another subject. 
but I will just emphasize that because I think in the um, in the public discussion, even in the specialized discussion, this double externality is not sufficiently appreciated. So key economic insight two, uh, this is one that's well known to people, probably most everybody in this audience, uh, and that is the idea of use of carbon prices and a little more, a little more subtle is the idea of harmonized carbon prices. So for economists, it is just the staple fare of meal of breakfast, lunch, and dinner that a high price on CO2 emissions is the key to sharp emissions reductions. That you need to face agents around the world, economic agents around the world, need to face strong incentives to reduce their carbon footprint not just the incentives of being moral people, not just the incentives of doing what is recommended by your neighbors or your town or your state, but the incentives of keeping profitable and of reduce and making your budget as a household go further. The um, way this works is very, subtle and this is why it's so important to rely on price because there's so many agents around the world there are literally billions of consumers probably making trillions of decisions a year there are hundreds of governments there are millions of firms thousands of governments if you include the lower level ones and all of these need to do their part and their part will be best incentivized if they face high prices. So that's half of it. But the other half is that the level of price should be harmonized across countries, across sectors, across jurisdictions to meet whatever your climate target is. Now your climate target might be a cost benefit optimum, it might be a two degree C target, it might be a three degree C target, whatever it is, you would want to have your carbon price harmonized across the different agencies, across the different countries, across the different sectors to meet your goal most efficiently. So let's just turn back to reality and ask what do prices look like? So this, this is a somewhat complicated uh, table, but I'll walk you through it. But basically, this is the carbon price landscape in 2019. And the, um, there, there are regions, countries, or uh, states within countries. And then the four columns are, the first is the percent of the region covered by whatever the price is, the carbon price. Then the carbon price in dollars per ton of CO2 in that second numerical column. Then the effective price, which is the carbon price multiplied by the percent. So column three is column one times column two in, divided by 100. And then the last one is the percent of global emissions that that represents. So if we start at the top of this list, which is Sweden, Sweden has a very high carbon price in, in 2019, had a very high carbon price of $127 a ton, but it covered only 40% of the, of the emissions, and therefore the effective price was about $50 per ton. And one of the things you note, if you look at the first column, is that countries tend not to cover the entire economy. Some are pretty low, for example, 18% where I live. Some are pretty high, like California, and Norway, and Japan. Um, France is relatively low. The ETS, which is in the middle of this, the European trading system, covers 
of the European economy. Then if you look, let's go to the right-hand column and look at those numbers. So there, there are some countries with relatively high carbon prices, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, BC. Uh, well, we'll go down to France, California, ETS. But notice that at least at the top, they cover only a very small fraction of global emissions. And if you come down to the bottom one, well, the price is zero. And so that covers 100%. And that is 80% of global emissions. So the point about the carbon price landscape, the point is that it's, well, let me just, I'm sorry, let me just finish. Let me look at the very bottom line here, which is the global average carbon price 219. 2019 was a little under two dollars a ton of carbon dioxide so not zero but it almost rounds to zero so there are two points i'd like to make as we look at this graph just to conclude first is and most important that the carbon price, which is an, a measure of the effectiveness of the power, I would say this, the strength of policy, the, the power of carbon policy around the world, that the average price is very low. So this actually then relates back to the very first slide I showed, which showed that there has not been a decline in the growth of emissions. emissions. And it's not surprising that there's no growth in the there's no decline in the growth of emissions that we haven't bent the curve down very much because the central policy that would we would be using which is carbon price is basically zero then the other thing which i would emphasize is the great deal of variability the lack of harmonization of carbon price among the different regions from say united states China, India, which are either in the 80% or slightly above the 80% of, of with essentially zero carbon price, up to basically European countries and a few others with relatively high carbon prices. So we have the landscape is very uneven. It's, it's very low, but it's very uneven. The third, um, point which actually follows quite after the, the quite nicely after the, the second is the key economic insight about international policy now those of you who had followed international climate policy know that it goes back for almost 40 years to the framework convention climate change in the early 1990s which was a voluntary agreement but then there were a number of important international agreements and treaties since then. The Kyoto Treaty or Protocol of 1997, the Copenhagen Accord, and most recently the Paris Accord of 2015. But the fact is that after 30 years of policy, international policy is at a dead end. It's, it's at a dead stop, maybe a better way to put it that we have policies but they have not been effective and they are getting us basically nowhere in terms of strong policies and that was really the point of this last slide that if you look at the international carbon price of 1.7 dollars per ton of co2 in 2019 we basically have gotten nowhere we're a dead stop we're at a dead stop and a dead end having made no progress. Now, why is that? Uh, the basic reason is that climate change policy is hampered by the free rider problem. And uh, what is the free rider problem? Well, the, uh, the way I like to think of the free rider problem is um, when I go to, a, I might go to a city, I might go to, I might go to Frankfurt, I might go to Paris, I might go to Vienna, uh, and if I just 
there's a trolley. Take a take something like Vienna or Zurich, where you have a trolley, and you get on, and there's no there's no barrier to getting on, and you have to decide: Are you going to pay, or are you going to ride free? Well, there is some there are some incentives not to ride free because you might get caught and be penalized, but in many cases that that incentive is so low as to be um, as to be useless in terms of an enforcement mechanism. So the free rider problem is you are t people in certain situations are tempted to ride free on the investments of others and to make no contributions of their own. And that is basically the way international climate policy has been designed. You can choose to take abatement policies either limited ones or modest ones or strong ones, or you can choose not to. But if you sign an agreement like the Kyoto Protocol and you decide not to participate or not to fulfill your agreements, then there's no penalty. Well, you might get a little complaint, you might get some complaints from your friends or your non, your people who are not your friends, but there's no serious penalty because the agreements are voluntary and there are no penalties for non-participation. And if you look at the what what the results are, the results are just what economic theory or common sense for that matter would predict that the verdict is that the actual carbon prices today are very low and the emissions reductions have been minimal. So this is um, this is part of the package of along with key economic insight two, is key economic insight three. Key economic insight two is you're going to get strong emissions reductions if you have high harmonized carbon prices. Key economic insight three is the global free rider problem of the way we've structured our international agreements would suggest very very little uh, costly emissions reductions. And that's what we have. So um, one possible solution is what I've called a climate club or climate compact. And it's a way of overcoming free riding. And it's basically to replace the current structure of climate agreements with what I call a club structure. Um, so what is a club structure? A club structure is one where when you join a club, but let's think of an organization or a compact or an international organization or multilateral agreement, uh, you have privileges and you have obligations. I, I said at the beginning that this idea had really been inspired by my looking at the European Union and looking at the, its structure. The structure of the EU, and I remember exactly when it was when I when I saw this. It was during the the crisis in Greece, and you might say, why in the world would Greece want to go along with the, these obligations? Uh, because they're so costly. And the answer, at least I said to myself, the answer is because there are privileges there are that you have from being a member of the EU. The, the obvious ones being the participation in the common market, in the in the single market. Um, and those, even though there's short run, a great deal of pain from having to meet your obligations, they're also currently in the long run, great privileges and benefits from being part of this club-like structure or, con or EU structure. And so the idea is move from a structures such as the current climate agreements, which are ones where you basically are voluntary, uh, there are no privileges and there are no obligations. So it's, it's basically a empty kind of club structure to move on with a club structure. Uh, I might just say a word on, um, so we, we did, I'll just say a word before we um, go on because I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our modeling at Yale on this. But it turns out that this is uh, a problem of coalition formation. It turns out to be one 
of great complexity. It, it, it sounds like a simple idea. Let's just get together and, and form a club or form a compact. But it's one that when you actually do it analytically is as hard a problem computationally as you can find. It's, it's a, like a traveling salesman problem for those of you who studied computer science. Uh, it's an extremely complicated problem. Um, and so that's what, one of the things that makes it interesting, but it also suggests how difficult it is to form these clubs or coalitions or compacts. So after having looked at the different possibilities, this is one that uh, I thought of and have modeled as a way to form a climate compact. And this compact involved a, re a regime with two features. The first is that the obligation of different countries in the, in the compact would be a target carbon price. And just to suggest, you might say $50 per ton of CO2. And then the second would be a penalty tariff on non-participants. And we might say 3% penalty, penalty tariff. And in this one, this is a uniform penalty, a uniform tariff. So just a couple of features I'll just mention about this before moving on. There are two things about this that would be a little unusual. You might look at the European trading system for CO2 as a kind of model, and it is a, it is a model, but it differs in a couple of respects um, to, to, to bring it to the larger world. First is, uh, the suggestion is that the target be carbon price rather than an emissions reduction uh, for the reason that it's actually much easier to negotiate and much easier to measure. Uh, we've seen in the man, very many attempts to negotiate emissions regimes how difficult it is, and it's not surprising because you have to difficult you have to negotiate once you've got a global cap on emissions, you have to negotiate n minus uh, one individual caps. Whereas with a carbon price, all you have to do is negotiate one price. Uh, I should say this was an insight of Martin Weitzman, who many of you may have known. Uh, in one of his last papers. So the first is the target would be carbon price, not quantities as a uh, performance. Then the second is, and this is widely, well, you ask, okay, what kinds of, um, oblig what kinds of obligations, what kinds of penalties could you have? Um, and as you look at the possible variety of um, penalties, it becomes very clear that some kind of trade related sanctions are the most flexible, easy to use, and have the right structure, incentive structure. And then within those, after some liberation, it could, it seemed to me that a tariff of a uniform tariff kind rather than a tariff on the carbon content of trade was actually more effective and easier to enforce and implement. So, but the basic point is you have two parts of a compact. One is you have a target, and here I recommend a carbon price, and the other is you have a penalty tariff of some kind. And those would be the necessary elements to make it work. Now, we have other international agreements that are like this, and obviously the World Trade Association and the, is an example where you have targets of your Tariff, your uh, tariffs that you've agreed to, and your penalties in terms of authorized retaliation. But the structure there is the same of a, of a compact or club where you have obligations and you have privileges. So uh, we've done a fair amount of modeling at Yale, and there's been work elsewhere as, as well uh, that actually took this and put it in a modeling framework, a multi country modeling framework, costs and benefits, both of the of the uh, climate side and of the trade side, the complicated trade model. And this suggests that this kind of structure is an effective way to combat free riding. Uh, you put this structure with a zero tariff, which is basically the way the Kyoto Protocol work and it goes to nothing. You put a uniform tariff of say 3% penalty tariff and it can support a carbon price of about $50 a ton. 
So that, that's a bigger subject. But the main point I want to get across here is that we need to rethink the architecture of our international climate agreements. The current architecture has failed. It's, we've been working with this for um, more than 20 years, and it has failed in, the, in its goal of getting steep abatement. History of international agreements and economic theory and common sense says, of course it fails because of the architecture. And therefore, we need to change the architecture. This is one proposal. There are many other proposals, but we need to change the architecture. Okay. Let me say, I'll use five minutes or so to talk a little bit about green finance. Um, uh, but before I do, I'll just say a word about <laughs> something else, which is uh, this, this, uh, this um, I'm writing a book on the green, the green society. And in that, uh, I discuss something called uh, societal catastrophes. And it's something I hadn't really thought about as a conceptual framework until uh, March of this year when we were hit with the current catastrophe. But it was kind of interesting when you thought about it. And you, when you think about the catastrophes from the catastrophes of war, the catastrophes, and then there are many economic catastrophes. There's the catastrophes of financial crises. There's the catastrophes of deep depressions. And then there are non-economic catastrophes, such as pandemics, which cause economic catastrophes. And then there's the one that we're talking about today, which is climate change, which is another. And they all have interesting different structures. But one of the things I hadn't really appreciated till I uh, thought about this systematically was that, I mean, they're obviously different in scale. They actually differ in dimension. They actually differ in our scientific knowledge. But I hadn't really appreciated the importance of the time scale in how these, these different catastrophes work. And uh, they, they vary in time scale from what I'll call the atomic scale, which are like nuclear, nuclear weapons or uh, atomic meltdowns, through scales of days and weeks, of pandemics and financial crises, financial meltdowns, if you like, through months and years, which is business cycles, through what we're talking about, I've talked about up to now, which is decades and centuries. So the time scale of these are so different. And of course, that means that the time scale on which we can contemplate and think about and deliberate about these disastrous catastrophic events is also so different. And for example, with a pandemic, you basically don't have time to think. If you don't have something in place, if you don't have your plan in place or, or on war, if you don't have your plan in place before it starts, you're done. And, and that's what we've seen in our countries. Uh, climate change is at the other extreme. It, 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 um, it, 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 it involves very slowly. There's a long time lag between uh, cause and effect. It gives you time to think. It gives you time to plan. It gives you time to measure. It gives you time to strategize. Um, you might say it gives too much time. Because we can always say, well, we'll worry about that next year. Well, we, we, we've got other things to worry about this year. We worry about climate change next year. And then you have this intermediate. And I, th I think it's in some way, as I look at the, sc the time scale of these different catastrophes, uh, I kind of think monetary policy is, is just at the right time scale. Because it's slow. you meet once a month. Things, things, do things evolve slowly. It's, it's not so far in the future. It's, you can ignore it. But it's not so fast that you can't deal with it. And it's a kind of interesting time scale where, of the, where you have time to deliberate uh, about something that's imminent but not too soon to act. Uh, so I, I, I thought this interesting relation between the different catastrophic events was uh, useful. Now, the other thing I want to talk about then is, is green finance is an interesting mixture of climate change, which is this long time scale and then the time scales of financial policy, which are the very, very short time scale of financial crises, and the month to year time scale of business cycles. So I had really a couple of things to say about that. First is um, 
what are the challenges for financial institutions? So these are the institutions that the central banks um, regulate and influence and have powerful influence on. And these are both comp these are not companies, but they're investors and they're financial institutions. And so maybe we'll start with the, with the companies. So it's clear that, and uh, President Lagarde mentioned this, uh, that companies need to incorporate the climate risks into their long-term planning. Now, companies are pretty good at long-term planning. They're actually, I think, better than governments. Uh, they're probably better than households. They're probably among the best planners in our society. And so they already have, actually, in many cases, incorporated climate risk, but not all of them. Uh, the, the electric utilities have clearly incorporated those, but not all the other companies. And so companies need to incorporate these as they do the other risks that they face. And then if you think of institutional investors or banks, they also need to analyze and hedge these climate-induced risks. And they need to face squarely the trade-off between return and ESG goals. Now, there's one insight from economics that I'd like to show here that that is not obvious until you think about it and that is the trade-off between profits and your say carbon reductions or esg goals and first is that many companies need to just think about their esg goals in terms of increasing returns and profits so they might be not thinking about it carefully and they can actually improve their profits or return by moving from a to b so moving from short-termism to long-termism, uh, capturing the, in just improving the quality of their workforce and so on. They can actually improve their returns or improve their profits. But the other interesting feature is for an a institutional investor that maximizes return or a company that maximizes its profit, is you can actually do a fair amount of ESG or a fair amount of income reduction with virtually no impact on your profits or returns. So this is the point being, if you're at the top of the hill and you move a little bit away from the top of the hill, you can actually move often quite a ways without any impact on your, any significant impact on your returns or on your profits. So this is the point you can reduce you can re turn down your, as a household, you can turn down your thermostat one degree or up one degree, depending on what time of year it is, and essentially no impact on your comfort and substantial impact on your energy use, uh, carbon footprint. But when all is said and done, I just want to emphasize, even though we like our companies to do their things, we like the institutional investors to do their analysis and hedging and so on and so forth, government action is essential. We cannot, we're not going to get, we can get a little bit of, of changes, a little bit of improvement through this um, ESG and through that moving down the hill a little bit, but we need universal carbon pricing and technology support if we're going to come anywhere near our goals. Final, uh, let me just say a word about green central banking. Uh, is there an impact of, central, of climate change on central banking? Um, yes, yes, because climate change is one of the many long-term risks. So if you were to write down, you could write a list of short-term risks, and you could write down a list of long-term risks, uh, and long-term ones being the long-term effect of the pandemic on the health, the demography, robots, artificial intelligence, then climate change should be added to that list of risks. And we should see what effect it would have on different areas. Maybe, um, as um, Lael Brainerd said in one of her recent, uh, Governor Lael Brainerd in one of her recent speeches, maybe this would affect our star, the, uh, the equilibrium interest rate, real interest rate. So yes, climate change has moved from not seen as important 30 years ago to seen as important now and will be put on the list of long-term risks and influences that we need to analyze. And yes, particularly in this area, because it may affect financial stability 
through its impact on financial firms, and it may require regulatory responses. So there are some places where now that it's become clearly important, more important in some areas than others, more important in some sectors than others, more important for some countries than others, but yes, it will be now a new concern for our central bankers. All right, well, that wraps it up, and I'll just um, just remind you of the four key points here. That uh, One is that there's been little progress to date on climate policy. A second is that the key policies are to invest in low carbon technologies and to impose high, car high, and, carbon harmonized, high and harmonized carbon prices. A third is we need to combat free riding with an international climate compact and that the current architecture is basically does not support, is not on a firm foundation. And finally, green finance can support, but collective action is essential for dealing with climate change. Thank you very much, and that concludes my remarks. Okay, well, well th thank you so much for, for, for that, I think, very wide-ranging uh, overview, which really, I think, uh, zeroes in on some of the big uh, policy challenges. Um, as you've been talking, uh, in, in the WebEx, a few people have written in uh, some questions. So let me uh, maybe collect these questions, and then you can see if there's any of these questions or comments you'd like to pick up. Uh, so, so one is from uh, Marcus Brunnemeyer who, uh, you know, in relation to the difficulty of having uh, effective global agreements, uh, asked the question, uh, given, given the problems so far with, with the uh, you know, global efforts to, to combat uh, CO2, can, can you comment about why the Montreal Protocol was effective maybe in helping to save the ozone layer? So, so what, what is similar, what is different between these, uh, that episode uh, and the current episode. So, so that's one question. Okay. Uh, so that, should I just start with that? Okay. Sure. Just because it's fresh on my mind. Yeah. The question's fresh. So sure. that's a really good question and an important question. It's been well studied. Uh, I would point to the work of uh, environmental scholar Scott Barrett, who has written on this, and my response basically draws on his research. So there are really um, three things that are different, three major things that are different. One is that if you looked at the cost-benefit analysis of the Montreal Protocol and the follow-up protocols, uh, there were ones that individual countries would find in their benefit to have a protocol. So in the case of global climate change, individual countries generally don't find it in their interest to take appropriate action. Whereas for the Montreal Protocol, the United States, when it did its uh, environmental assessment, found that it should ban chlorofluorocarbons even if there were no benefits anywhere outside the United States. So the cost-benefit analysis was much, much more favorable for chlorofluorocarbons than it is for CO2. Uh, a second reason is it's just much more, it's just much cheaper. Uh, the, the amount of the, the total investments that were needed to not just reduce chlorofarms, but ban them and replace them with other chemicals was just, I think, literally an order of mag three orders of magnitude smaller, smaller by a fraction of a thousand than the costs of, we're, we're contemplating with climate change. And a third is a kind of interesting uh, political point, which is the company that was the lead producer of chlorocarbons, which was DuPont, actually had substitutes for chlorofluorocarbons that were pretty quickly ready to go uh, as substitutes. They were a little more expensive than the ones that were banned, but they could do the, they could do the job. They could cool your houses, for example, and they could do it relatively inexpensively. They're more expensive than uh, ones that were banned, but still relatively inexpensively. So you had industrial, in contrast now where you have industrial opposition and actually worse, uh, 
on climate change and fossil fuel companies with the Clara Floor Commons, you had industrial support. I don't know, I, I, I've not seen the studies on this, but I don't know if DuPont actually profited in the long run, um, but that's an interest. But they certainly didn't, weren't driven into the grave. Sure. Very good. Okay, so, so uh, Philip Hartman uh, is asking, if you go back to the idea of how to form a club, how do you take into account the stock versus flow issue, which is, of course, the cumulative of stock formations has been mostly by the rich countries, and if you're trying to include the emerging markets, developing countries, who on a flow basis might be high emitters, but were, have contributed less to the cumulative of stock of, of emissions, um, can, can you design a club that allows for, for that, if you like, climate justice point about differentiating between the stock versus the flow? I think this is part of the broader issue of you might call environmental justice across countries and climate justice across countries. Um, I would tend myself to think more not in terms of contributions or lack of contributions to the stock of emissions, although the stock of concentration of emissions in the atmosphere, uh, you could do that. But I would think in terms of the ability of different countries to pay and also the necessity of, of different countries to be part of a, of a compact. For example, I think if you look at the, just look at the raw numbers, it's clear that um, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia need to be part of any effective system, but it's probably not necessary for uh, tropical African countries to join up right away. So you need to, first you need to be realistic about what countries need to be in to make it effective, and then which do not. And then the other thing is you might have, you, you could have different incentives for countries. You could um, actually have transfers to help countries uh, to uh, join. But I, but I would make one point, just a general point, which, which is uh, maybe not clear. In my thinking about any of these international agreements, I would emphasize that, say, if there's a carbon tax, be absolutely, absolutely emphatic that the revenues from the carbon tax in, say, India or China or Indonesia stay within the country. Uh, I'm not contemplating some going into some international fund. Um, so the incent this is very important for the incentives of individual countries that they need to see if they join the country as a tax, say, that the revenues stay in the country. And then the second point is that actually a carbon tax is a pretty effective tax for countries with weak tax systems. Country, most countries need revenues for health systems, for education, and for infrastructure. And so they can see this as a way of participating in an international agreement, getting international value for their tax system, and helping the country. Uh, and if they feel they have too many revenues, they can reduce other taxes. So, so this is this, they're good. This is a tax on a bad, not a tax on a good. So I think I would actually make a strong case that a carbon tax has strong benefits for individual countries, even if there were not an international agreement. Very good. Okay. So uh, from Alexander Leip Leipold, uh, who has asked a, a range of questions. Let me uh, subdivide and one question, since you mentioned uh, that you've been thinking about societal catastrophes. When you think about tail risk, if you like, in respect to climate change, um, how do you think about the, you know, the fact, clearly in uh, worst case scenarios, it's kind of a, a truly catastrophic, uh, the potential impact. Uh, so when, when we talk about the kind of correct schedule for uh, carbon prices and so on, uh, how do you work in uh, this, this tail risk and catastrophe risk into the cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, well, this, this is, um, as I'm sure many of you know, a very controversial area in climate um, change science and climate change economics. Uh, let, let, me, let me separate micro-catastrophes and macro-catastrophes. So there's just no doubt that you're going to have many micro-catastrophes whether it's people with the wildfires burning their houses, or whether it's small islands who are submerged, or whether it's cities that are inundated, or whether it's regions that are struck by hypercanes, 
uh, there's just no doubt that you're going to have those, and you'll probably have an increased frequency of those. Um, and and I, that that leads you down one path of how to deal with the insurance aspects of that, or dealing with the transfers. But if you think of macro catastrophes, um, that's that's a more complicated issue. Uh, I'm actually on the side of that that says uh, that that has argued that we that's it's possible but we have not seen any actual evidence of that. Um, and so we would right, regard this as, uh, as it's a tail risk of something where we're actually not sure whether there's a risk there that would be a tail risk, that's a tail risk or a fat tail distribution. But if it is, then um, if, if we think it is, or we think that the possibility of this tail risk is sufficiently high, then that just emphasizes that we need to take strong policies. So in almost every case where we're thinking of these tail risks, there are ones with rapid accumulation of CO2 and rapid climate change. So if you think that the risk of the, this tail risk are growing as you get higher and higher concentrations, then that would argue for more, um, just stronger policies. So uh, I would say that adds, it adds to the, um, to the need for policy. But, but, but I just want to add one other point. Um, we're not, we're not, we're not anywhere near where, where we should be if there were no tail risks. So we still have a long way to go. Let's assume there are no tail risks at all. We still have a very, very long way to go to get where we ought to be. So let's, let's get there. Let's at least start and get there. And then at that point, once we're at the point where we haven't incorporated tail risks, okay, how much more do we want to add? But we don't need to argue about tail risks because we're not even where we ought to be without tail risks. So um, I, I think this leads me to, to a, a question asked by Luke Laven, which I suppose the connection now is if you go back to the other policy challenge in the double externality, which is how to correct the underinvestment in, in uh, technology. Again, do you see a, a possible difference in ty the types of policies we should have between uh, promoting innovation that basically does a good general job of, uh, you know, improving, uh, uh, reducing the carbon intensity of, of the economic production versus innovation, uh, which is really focused on the tail risk. So it's, you know, so it's, it's clearly you can imagine uh, uh, the kind of, uh, if, you know, an invent, uh, you know, a scientist or a group of scientists or a group of entrepreneurs, um, do they have a bigger, uh, are their incentives more distorted in terms of uh, trying to deal with the, with the tail risk, or are there, are there incentives more distorted trying to deal with just the general uh, shift in, in the technology towards uh, lower lower carbon intensity? Or is there, is there any clear way to think about that? Well, I think that's it. I'd never actually thought of that. So there's a trip. Maybe there's a triple externality here. Then you have right. you have the externality of innovation. You have the externality of the underpriced. Uh, impact of uh, emissions, and then maybe I, I don't. Know, I have to think about this a little more. But maybe there's also another externality that we don't treat properly these tail events. Uh, so I mean, one of the things that I, in doing that in in thinking about teaching this course on societal externalities, it's interesting to see in how many areas we have underestimated. We we have actually not even incorporated the need for dealing with tail risk. I mean, you think of financial crisis, which this group is available, is very familiar with. If you think of one of the lessons of 2008 is that we really didn't understand properly the tail risks that were involved in many of these new instruments that were allowed. Uh, now in case of pandemics, uh, actually went back, at this experience, I'll just maybe tell a little story. In March, I went back and searched, because I, I have I work on catastrophes and worst case scenarios and all these friends who are worried about it. So I went back and I searched all my emails for the word pandemic to see if I ever, ever got uh, an email on pandemic. And actually I found two or three, but uh, they were one, the only one person, one of them was just a long list of t terrible things could happen. But one person said, do you think we're underestimating the risk of pandemics? And uh, I, I don't, I didn't even look at my answer, but I think the answer is clearly we were. Uh, 
So maybe this is another, I don't know, it's not quite an externality, but it's a more behavioral problem that you're bringing up, which is, should we do we need to deal with the fact that we're this third, it's not externality really, but under, under in the inability to respond appropriately to these tail events. Sure. Okay, I'm going to gather or blend uh, some, some comments and questions from Alexander Leopold and uh, Klaus Mazouk. And it's really one element which maybe goes to political economy is we, we've seen this year with the pandemic, it's hit some sectors very heavily. Other sectors have been much less affected. So there's a clear difference, for example, between travel, tourism, entertainment heavily hit versus other parts of the economy less hit. Equally with, with climate change, uh, you know, if you're providing, for example, a service which maybe doesn't very much use uh, uh, energy too much, may, may, maybe those sectors will be less directly affected than, than a, you know, the energy producing sector or capital intensive sectors. So, so that's uh, one, uh, in terms of building the coalition, building the coalition who will support a, a forceful government action, uh, that's partly within every country, partly it's global, depending on the mix of industries across different countries. But, but maybe connected to that is also, um, you know, the, the way you concluded, you know, I would very much agree that it'd be a mistake to focus on green finance as a substitute for fundamental public policy, the fundamental public policies of uh, carbon taxes, promoting uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, reducing uh, technology. Um, but, but is there a risk that the political economy could get distracted by focusing on activities which, which are kind of maybe half at the margin, but at the margin? And, you know, how, how do we balance the, the effort and energy going into reforming the financial system versus advocating, um, you know, these first order government challenges, uh, whether domestic or building that, that government coalition. So that's kind of blending uh, some different questions coming in uh, from, the, from the floor. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand yeah. the, the question. Well, I mean, it, it, may, it may be more of a comment than a question in fairness, okay. as opposed to, <laughs> it's a good comment. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, but, but I suppose, I mean, uh, maybe to, to try and say it in a clearer or stronger way, um, in the end, uh, unless there are those serious anti-carbon uh, policies, whether it's uh, carbon prices plus the uh, pro-innovation policies, everything else I'm asking you to, to see if you agree or, not, or disagree is secondary. You know, th th there's, no, there's no substitute for, for those first order policies. Yeah. But maybe connecting to that, is there, we have a good question about are you re relying maybe too much on carbon price taxes versus quantity restrictions? So again, this issue about uh, is it the case we can find alter maybe they're inefficient, but maybe they're easier to 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 get done uh, having more quantity restrictions? Yeah, let, let me take the last. Well, those are those are two very different ones, but let me take the last one, which is fundamental, and I think. Um, I want to make clear. I want to make clear my view on that, which is I'm not. So in the proposal I put forth uh, for the carbon compact, it was the benchmark was a carbon price, but I didn't actually say that what the tool or instrument was to reach that, and that would be left to different countries. For example, some countries might want to use a carbon tax and just put a $50 carbon tax on. And other countries might want to use a cap and trade type system. Um, and that's really up to country. And they can use a cap and trade system where they can auction them off, or they can use a cap and trade system where they give them away to worthy constituents. Um, but they would need to find, a, if they did that, they would need to find a cap and trade system with a, with a floor on it so that it won't be going fluctuating between 70 and $10. Uh, so I would just say in this respect, the, the European trading system had this flaw very from the very beginning, 
which I think has been not completely fixed, but it actually been worked on in the last five years to make sure you don't have this falling down to going down the great volatility and the very low price. But for myself, I, I think it's critical that these are the kinds of decisions that you want to give the countries flexibility about. You know, we are not we country A. We're just we we can only deal with taxes. We country B can never deal with taxes because we have this strong federal structure and we can't uh, another one because we have an anti-tax movement. So the point is, you can have any kinds of and you can have maybe there's another one I haven't thought of it. There are only two I know of that you can get the high carbon prices out of. Maybe there's another one. Uh, but the point is, you want to do it to get the carbon price. The carbon price is basically a, it's a performance standard, and you can meet this performance standard using different, uh, you can call administrative technologies. They're not like tailpipe technologies, they're administrative technologies. So it's really important that that's a way of measuring, of putting the bar that countries have to get over, but they can, they can pull up backwards or forwards or upside down or whatever. But they have to get over the bar of $50.